Let me put on my, uh, before we get off, uh, uh, this, let me put on my devil's uh, advocate uh, cap and uh, ask you something. So I, need to, I need to see your devil. Yeah, you need the real cap. I need to see the horns. I should. Uh, my forehead is looking awfully high on this video, so I should be wearing some kind of cap, I think. But uh, what if I, if I came up to you and said, uh, hey, Peter, uh, why shouldn't I, uh, because I read uh, the latest uh, Ruckus Network's uh, press release, why shouldn't I uh, install a private uh, LTE uh, network uh, instead of uh, Wi-Fi? Why, why shouldn't I uh, look at that in my enterprise, since that's what uh, you, you, they're trying to sell now? Okay, this is this is CBRS, right? Yes, CBRS. Yes. So, so it's it's five G on unlicensed spectrum. Yeah. Okay. And so, so clearly, I'm not going to comment on their product line or the stuff because that's not my job. I'm going to think about this for a second. You're just asking so about the technologies. About, yeah. Sure. So I don't know about you, but I'm I'm sitting in in my office. So I do. I have my phone sitting here. My phone is talking both LTE and Wi-Fi. And then my laptop is, of course, only talking Wi-Fi. So if you move to full LTE, I'd need to go and sell dongles to everyone, or everyone would have to buy LTE inside laptops. Go. Okay. What's that going to do? Uh, well, it's going to defer adoption for quite a while. So it's an awesome story for phone for phones. You're yeah, not so crash hot for the vast bulk of installed. Assets, you know, so that's fine. So your laptop's going to change over in five years. That's going to take you a while. Then the next question becomes, again, as far as I know, the signaling technologies between 5G and Wi-Fi 6 are pretty similar. So I don't think you're going to see a big change there. So the question is, if I'm in an enterprise building, if I'm going to do an upgrade, right, and mostly we all do upgrades of my infrastructure, you know, I can basically pull out old access points and put in new ones and nothing much changes, right? going to be a software update on my wireless controller probably. Um, I'm going to offer service to all the people that are in there, it's just going to be better. If I move to LTE, the question becomes is who am I paying to operate it? Right? Is that my is that my network or someone else's? So there's a one thing is 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 it is it an enterprise asset or you're outsourcing it? And if you're outsourcing it then is it Wi-Fi or is it 5G? So if you had only smartphones in and you only cared about the new ones, I think 5G would be awesome. But if you're upgrading an enterprise network that's running today, I have trouble understanding how going all LT is easy. I think it, you'd need at least a mix of, of Wi-Fi 6 and LTE. Thanks for that. I just I couldn't uh, resist uh, asking that. But uh, but maybe we should but get back that, to the Ethernet stuff. But does that, does that story make sense? I mean, again, you know, you just think about it. Does. Like, you got to split between how cool technology and adoptability. I mean, even even in 5G by itself, you know, tracking what I was hearing, for instance, because I I don't know if I told you, but I, I, was, I was speaking at IWCS in Shanghai recently. Oh yeah, one you mentioned. I was doing one of the things I was talking about there. Some of the other speakers was was 5G. And there's going you know, to definitely be a density problem because the density of 5G has to go up a lot. So it's clearly going to be an interesting problem to solve in, in cities like Shanghai. If they have to, for instance, I, don't, I can't remember the numbers, so someone should go check, but I think the cell size is like a fifth or less. So if I've got to go and deploy you know, that many more times of the radios and end devices, I'm going to need cabling for that. It's going to be an interesting problem. Well, you know, the uh, cabling market is supposed to increase at a uh, 6% uh, CAGR uh, till uh, 20... Cool, 20. I'm not worried about the cable, I'm worried about the rights of way. If you're, in a, if you're in a big city and you need to put in five times as many base stations, like, how are you going to get them in? The cable is cool, am I going to go and dig more holes in the street? Yeah, especially a place like uh, Shanghai. So, uh, is this an argument for fixed wireless or some of these other things? You know, it's, it's um, not an argument. I'm sure we're going to solve the problem. I think it's just, it's the case of this transition is going to be challenging. Is it going to happen? I'm sure it's going to happen. But it's not, you know, because, you know, the, the thing we talked about before, if I introduce a new technology and I can reuse all the installed infrastructure, that's an easy upgrade. If I have to rethink the infrastructure, it's just a more complicated, expensive upgrade. It makes it harder to adopt. You got you got a segue for uh, what we've been talking about into uh, single pair uh, Ethernet. Sure. All right. So so that's my thing. You know, adding value infrastructure. So mm -hmm. what I'm involved in now is is what's called single pair Ethernet. 
So what we're doing here is we're basically taking, I mean, this effort's been going for a while because it started off really with, it started off, you know, the discussion's been going for ages. Standards-wise, it started off for cars. So they have standards for 100 base T1 and 1,000 base T1. And mm-hmm. that's been basically built around the transformation networking inside cars to Ethernet. Yeah. If you go take a look at um, what's happening in the high-end cars, they want to become all Ethernet, and they're basically going to end up becoming a, a mini enterprise network included data center inside a car. So they need to do this for a whole lot of reasons. One of them is cabling weight because the cabling harness on a car is a major component of both the space required and the weight. And cars right. care about weight a lot. They also need, if you're starting to go, you know, assisted driving, I'm not going to go autonomous, so assisted driving, all that stuff needs communications. Yep. So if you're, for instance, if you're running both video screens, possibly radar or LIDAR, right, you need to backhaul that somewhere. So they basically want to backhaul it as a frame grower and backhaul it to machine vision processing. So. Mm-hmm. Right now, as I said, 100,000 base T1 are already defined. Um, there's actually efforts going on in, in IEEE at the minute. There's a working group doing two and a half, five and 10 gig over single pair copper cars. They're about to start up one going 25 gig. Now, in reality, though I'm appreciative of that technology, that's not the space I play in. One I'm interested in is one that I think actually might have predated the cars in terms of discussion was 10 megabit single pair, a single copper pair out to a kilometer. So let me rephrase that. 10 megabit single pair Ethernet over copper at out to a kilometer. Okay. Like, what are you doing that for? Yeah. So I will draw your attention to what's known as the field bus environment, or at least I call that, which is the way almost all automation runs. So this is the OT network. Okay. So if you think about how people wire up, you know, oil and gas plants or production lines or coal mines or anything like that, yep. they use various field buses and there's there's an alphabet soup of field buses. I mean, I have, I have a slide hanging around somewhere um, which I can drop you a link to. And what it shows is in in 1990-ish, right, we had an alphabet soup of networking stuff. Right? We had RS-232, 485, we had SDLC and HDLC and Burroughs and Sperry and all this other stuff and all the physical connections, right? Some was coax, yep. some was this, some was that. You know, we had ArcNet, we had uh, DeckNet. Yeah. So we had an alphabet soup of that in protocols. That's sort of where I see the automation business thing today. There's three major automation alliances for industrial alliances, um, ODBA, I think, uh, Procure International and Fieldcom. And everyone has their own set of protocols. They're sort of converging to IP and TCP or, or IP and Ethernet. But at the minute, that's like the core of the network. The edge of the network is still a field bus that way. Um, yeah, and there's lots of varieties of this. So, you know, again, if you go back, so this is a very conservative market, right? And we talked earlier about difficulty recabling buildings, right? If you want to recable an oil and gas plant, that's a huge problem. Yeah. So, and their lifetime is even longer. So the goal here is to figure out a way to let them upgrade. Now they also have a couple other problems, right? They all want to go cloud connected. They want to do preventive maintenance and all this other stuff. But today they'll send out the Ethernet in the middle, then at the edge they'll have a gateway box of some sort which is doing the conversion of the field bus. Mm-hmm. That in and of itself is becoming a problem. The field buses tend to run at, you know, tens to hundreds of kilobits a second. So the goal is to basically convert that last part of the infrastructure to running Ethernet. So replace the gateway by a switch and replace the, the micro at the center of the end by an Ethernet device. You know, so this is this is a medium sized microcontroller. Mm-hmm. Which is now doing is you'd be running modern protocols across this thing. Again, it's the incremental up that sort of idea. Yeah. So, you know, in, in, in time has passed, let's say you got an alarm from a machine, right? You might send some guy who looked like me out with a hammer. He's going to whack it, listen to it, and tell you what's wrong. Well, as you know, we're all going off to do different things. Someone who's going to come out of college today really wants to go with a smartphone, log in and see what's going on. So if we can enable that, right, we've done, we've done a huge service to humanity. Wow, well, that's uh, that's uh, a good story. By the way, it it also applies inside buildings. So building and industrial automation are actually quite similar. I mean, they're different products and they're different families, but they have exactly the same problem. So, I mean, I recently got a slide from uh, Panjit on this. Um, they built themselves a brand new swanky headquarters a few years ago. Right. For the time being, let's just assume Panjit know what they're doing, which I think is a pretty fair assumption. 
<laughs> so it was LEED certified and as automated as I could make it. And if I recall the numbers correctly, they put in 600,000 feet of 6 and 6A. They put in 500,000 feet of single pair. Mm -hmm. I'm going to assert that, that probably older buildings have significantly more single pair than um, four pair. Wow. That's, uh... So do me a favor, look, look up for a second. Take a look in the ceiling and see how many devices you can that are controlled somehow. And if I look up, I can see um, a temperature sensor, a fire alarm, yep. and so we got yep. I got two air conditioner things. So there's two HVAC things in there. I got a yep. I got a Light. sprinkler and something else. Yep, exit sign. And so all those things are controlled by usually independent OT networks inside the building. Right, but it could all be so Ethernet. That, so that's the market because that means that we can we can make it easier to adopt new technologies. So the networking business can basically do its thing, right? So we can pick up the past 30 years worth of networking advances, you know, firewalls and segmentation and intrusion prevention, all that other stuff. And we can let the guys who build automation focus on what they do well. Thank you again for, uh, for doing the call with us.